Hi everyone and welcome to this No Talk. I'm Sam and I'm part of the Avino team and I'm super excited to be your host for this next hour. I hope you're as excited as me about this event and we have some fun stuff coming up that I think you will enjoy a lot. So 2022 sets a special mark for us at Avinode because we're celebrating 20 years. And during this year, we've been looking back at a team as what have we been doing and, and what achievements and accomplishments have we done? And we're so happy with what has happened. But there's two things that really sticks out in our reflections on these past 20 years. The first one is our great collaboration with all of you guys that are joining here today. Some of you may have been with us from the very start and some of you may have joined us more recently. But we really believe that it's together with you guys that we have been able to make such great accomplishments and development in our industry together. And that's something we really enjoy and we also want to continue working closely together with all of you to make sure that we make the best of the future of, of the business. The second thing that I am astonished about our team here at Avenode is that everyone is so focused on the future. So even if we look back a little bit, our focus is so on the future and how to continue developing, making solutions and making things that make sense for you guys. And that also helps us as an industry to move forward, be digital, be innovative and all of that that we want to be. So with this in mind, we have set the theme for this event to being about the future, the future of business aviation. And we're going to zoom into some different elements and things here, which I think is super, super exciting. Talking about next, it's time for me to present our first speaker, Daniel Levine. He's a future trend expert and he's one of the best in the world, I think. I've listened to him a few times and it's so inspiring to listen to trends and how they connect. And we asked Daniel to actually dig a little bit deeper into aviation industry and travel to see what may be in the future for us. And I think we have Daniel uh, online here. Hi, Daniel. Yes, hi, Joel. It's uh, great to be with you. Thank you. I know we had some technical issues, but it worked out in them. That's awesome. Um, and you are in New well, York, you know, I, I understand. I, I, I am in New York and the, the, the tech issues, it's so interesting, you know, that the world is moving so quickly and sometimes technology doesn't quite catch up, but uh, it's wonderful when we when we figure it out in the end. And so we're here and, and Avinode asked me to take a look at sort of the what, what the world will look like in the next 20 years. Uh, now that Avenode is celebrating its uh, 20th anniversary. And so uh, I thought it was a wonderful project. And I, I was doing a, a, a special research specifically for this presentation. And one of the things I came across was a magazine from uh, from Paris in 1900. And they uh, there was an illustrator who was taking a look at what the world would look like 100 years later. So what the world would look like in 2000, according to an illustrator in 1900. And this this is one of his illustrations. It's it's um what uh, I guess it would look like to have uh, Roombas around the house doing your cleaning. Um, of course, uh, the this illustrator didn't have the idea of uh, of plug-in electricity. Uh, in the in the next slide, uh, there's a picture of what the illustrator thought it would look like um, to have telemedicine. Uh, and um, the, uh, the this idea, are, are we seeing the telemedicine slide? Is that uh, coming up? I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, the, the uh, uh, here it is. The, um, the illustrator uh, had a pretty good idea of, of what it would look like to have a doctor talk to you by computer. Um, I, I, I like those uh, those hands. But my, my favorite is this, uh, the last illustration, um, which uh, was this, uh, th this illustrator sort of concept of what FaceTime might look like in 1900, really sort of got it right. I mean, we don't have the, uh, those flying cars in the background any longer, uh, or, or, or yet, I should say. Um, but what I, what I think he got exactly, or she got exactly right, um, is here you have two people sitting together, talking on the phone, completely ignoring each other. So um, uh, in, in some ways, they were absolutely right. But it's amazing to me how fast the world is changing. And if you, you know, look at from when, the, when, when Kitty Hawk, uh, the, the, the Wright brothers invented Kitty Hawk and their first flight was in 1903. And then the first moon landing was in 1969. And it's, 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 it's only 66 years apart. It's amazing how fast the world changes. And you know, technology has happened so quickly that 
you know, a lot of people don't realize that just last year we landed a helicopter on Mars. Um, and if you look at this, this, this next slide is the picture of the, of the helicopter. It's called Ingenuity. It landed on Mars last year. And the fact that most people or many people don't even know that this, that this is a fact right now, for me, shows us how quickly things move in the world. And, um, and, and it's just amazing to think about what the next 20 years will look like. Um, Joel introduced me as, uh, as, as sort of a, a futurist. I like to think of myself more as a, a trends expert. Um, it, looking into the future is super hard. And what I love about this chart, this graph, is that if you look at this trend line of the Dow Jones Industrial Average over 20 years, um, it's hard to tell where that trend is going. Is it going up or down in 20 years? And what's really counterintuitive about futurism or, or trend spotting is that it's actually easier to understand or know what's going to happen 100 years from now than 20 years from now. And here's a slide of the Dow Jones Industrial Average over 100 years where you can see it's a, it's a, clear, uh, a clear graph up. Um, we can easily extrapolate from this that the next 100 years, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average will continue to go up. Uh, but if you just take a small slice of 20 years, uh, it's really hard to tell. Now, when most people think about uh, tr uh, trends, they think about statistics like global GDP could increase by 75 percent uh, by 2042, which is amazingly important for businesses, of course, to see those sorts of statistics. Um, but just as important is to look at your business from the perspective of sort of a, the, the holistic world, the way customers see it. And so, you know, I, I bet you never thought of your business connected to, you know, Lego or Uni, Unilever or Apple or Patagonia or, or all the other sort of businesses that are out there that you could see on the next slide. It's when we work in, in trends, we sort of think about that there's two parts of the, the trends mind. And one part is statistics, there's strong numbers, and we work hand in glove with companies that do that. But the other part of it is what I like to think of as sort of the sexy part. Um, you know, what what are those uh, what are those people thinking and feeling? What, what 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 is the future going to look like? Not just because of strong numbers, but because it's actually people populating the future, and we're the ones who are building that technology and making those changes. So. I brought with me today a few different trends and um, with the, under different topic headings. And the first one I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about is the future of transport. Um, th there's so many things that are going to change the world in the next 20 years. But what I wanted to do in this presentation is not just say, talk about sort of new inventions that will happen in 20 years, but really uh, sort of have you think about how our world will change in 20 years, what 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 the world we will be living in will look like. And so when you think of it, there's, there's so many very big changes that are happening. And, and one of them is autonomous vehicles, which is going to have the first major impact really when it comes to autonomous trucking. Because autonomous trucks are going to be much easier to get on the road. The, most of the uh, most of the traveling that they do will be on, on highways. And so it's much easier for the autonomous equipment to understand how to ride on a highway than that. The complicatedness of figuring out how to negotiate city streets. And so I believe that in 20 years, we're gonna be seeing a lot of autonomous trucks on our highways uh, long before we see autonomous trucks or cars on our city streets. Um, it's going to change the way that, uh, that that cargo is shipped. We're going to be seeing cargo not shipped only by truck, but also by uh, by, by balloon. Um, right now, it's very difficult to get cargo to hard to reach places over mountains. And those those last few miles or kilometers, there are going to be shipped by these sorts of air balloons. There's I've seen at least a dozen different companies now that are uh, working on this. And from what we can tell, uh, this sort of technology will be quite normal 20 years from now. When it comes to, to ships on the water, 
we will see autonomous cargo ships again long before we'll be seeing autonomous cars be part of uh, regular part of our lives. The um, uh, in fact, uh, just last month, the first autonomous cargo ship made uh, a, a a long journey. Uh, that's without any humans on board, completely uh, completely run from afar. And the advantage of this is multifold. One is that um, you don't have to have a, a crew on board, and so the ships can go for much longer than they can right now. Um, it will eliminate or reduce the problem of piracy because you can build the ships in such a way that they're very hard to board. And if you were to board them, very hard to control because the control rooms can be inside giant safes, basically, um, and che cheaper to run um, because uh, you won't have to pay a crew, which at this point they say is about 17% of the cost of, uh, of, of ocean container shipping. So where does that leave us with uh, with autonomous cars? Well, um, as I said, you know, when you look at uh, the world 100 years from now, it's easier to tell what's going to happen than 20 years from now. So I, I think I could feel pretty confident saying that 100 years from now, we will have autonomous cars and it'll be normalized for all of us. Whether that's going to be normal for us 20 years from now, I think that that jury is still out. And I'd be curious to hear what uh, you all have to say about that. Um, for me, the most fascinating thing about autonomous vehicles um, isn't just that it changes our transport, but it changes the places in which we live, like um, having wireless charging for parking or just cities themselves. And here's a, an example of what a city might look like once it's changed because of autonomous cars, because autonomous cars will be speaking to each other so they can travel much faster on narrower lanes. You'd only need one. It would mean that inside a city, you could have much more uh, pedestrian space. You wouldn't necessarily need to have parking on most streets because cars could park further away and then be summoned when you need them. Um, and so from what we're seeing, this sort of work is already starting to be done in cities to figure out how to change and manage the cities for the advent of autonomous cars. And certainly by 20 years from now, we will be living in cities where they're starting to change actually the cities we live in to be more pedestrian friendly and sort of pedestrian first rather than car first, the way most cities are built right now. Similarly, we're seeing changes that are happening in trains at the moment, and there's billions of dollars of investment being put into trains, uh, especially in uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Unfortunately, not so much in uh, in my country. And, um, and, and if you've just had your ear to the media, one of the things that we're hearing quite a lot about now is um, people taking short to medium-sized trips uh, are sort of being nudged over to trains um, because they're, people are thinking about um, whether airplanes are going to be as, uh, as good for the environment as trains. Although I do have something to say about that because in the future, airplanes will be just as good for the environment. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to packaging, we're from this slide where you can see that there's a lot happening in, in uh, autonomous drones. And um, in fact, my company is working with the US Post Office right now uh, on drone mailboxes about where to deliver these packages. And for me, again, what's so interesting is the way that these drones will be changing cities so that mailboxes will look different. Um, the way that we get our packages or, or, or perhaps shop will change. We might be shopping in stores in 20 years that don't have so much stock in the shop themselves because you just buy what you want when you try it on, feel it in the store, and they just, just have it delivered to you. Those drones will require that we rethink the way that our airspace is created. And so there's a lot of people now working on drone zones, drone flight zones, so that we, we need to, to change the way that our airspace is being used for airplanes on the top, then drones uh, and, and, and other local flying vehicles, uh, all of this is being rethought right now. Now, a lot of people ask me, um, where will flying cars be in 20 years, or maybe even 100 years? And um, 
when I think about flying cars, uh, it's something that we've been talking about probably for you know most of our careers. And I just don't think they're going to happen. X on flying cars, because if you see the way that people drive in regular cars, you think they're going to allow these same people to fly in flying cars? No way, not going to happen until the flying cars are autonomous. And then I suppose it will happen. But 20 years from now will not be the age of flying cars. The um, the next look at 20 years, let's talk about uh, the future of luxury uh, a little bit. Um, one thing that's uh, just a truism in our world is that the rich are getting richer. Uh, it, it's a fact. And when you look at, at, at graphs of, of this, it's, it's clear to see. One thing that's really interesting, I think, from this particular one is that you could see that that disparity between the super rich and everyone else is much larger in the United States than it is in, in, in Europe, but uh, it's going up in Europe too, that share of national income earned by the top 10% of earners. Um, but what's just as interesting is not only are the rich getting richer, but that everyone is getting richer. There's a lot more rich people now than there were 20 years ago. And 20 years from now, there will be many, many more rich people than there are now. So ultra high net worth individuals, uh, those are people who are uh, making over $100 million. Um, there's uh, you know many thousands now, and there will be tens of thousands 20 years from now. So for any of you who are selling to these people, um, it, the, the, the market is looking good. You know, just as an aside, Throughout my entire career in travel and tourism, working with travel and tourism clients, um, I've I've seen uh, prices for for regular hotel rooms or or, or regular flights um, they they go up and down, but the uh, expensive ones, the, the 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 luxury side of the market just keeps going in one direction, and um, again extrapolating that to the next twenty years, we'll continue to see that. We do a lot of work in my business about um, understanding sentiment and sentiment analysis of what people who are in the luxury field are looking for. And, um, and, and this, uh, this um, chart shows you what the, the sort of words that we see most about uh, unique experiences, quality, service, exclusive. These are all sort of the, the things that people think about when they think about luxury. Uh, and one of the biggest is that one right in the middle uh, about experiences. And we're seeing that just more and more that that's what people are looking for rather than things, experiences. I, I love this slide. It's a picture of the Hotel Kekslautenin. It's in, uh, it's in northern Finland. Um, and it's a, um, it's a glass igloo. So it invites you to lie back in your bed in the middle of the night and watch the northern lights in the middle of winter. And for me, that really sort of exemplifies this idea of experiences. Uh, but as does the next slide, which is um, comes from, from Airbnb experiences, where they invite people to have uh, high tea with, with, a, with a sheep uh, in England. Is a sheep, a sheep is a, yeah, that's, both, that's both singular and plural. I guess with a sheep or sheep. And um, again, what, you know, the, the Airbnb experience is, is one of the fastest parts, uh, growing parts of Airbnb. Um, and the reason is because people are looking for experiences uh, rather than things. The idea of experiences means a lot of things. Um, it could mean just having peace and quiet. And this is a slide from Japan Airlines where they're, when you uh, choose your seat on the airplane, they're now showing you where babies are sitting so you can choose a seat that's in a quieter section, unless you absolutely love screaming babies. And then, of course, you can choose a seat next, next to one of those. Um, when, I, when I first um, went to the Mandarin Oriental Hotel in Las Vegas, I was, uh, I was welcomed by this robot. This is Pepper the Robot. And instead of a, a human, Pepper the Robot came to me and, and, and helped me check in. And I thought that that was super cool. And at, for a flash, I thought, is, is this the future of, of luxury? This, this, this really like, cool technology? Uh, but then very quickly, uh, 
right after that, I started staying in hotels where the robots looked like this. Um, and instead of having a human deliver room service to me, a robot rolled up to the door, the phone rings and says, you know, your, your lunch is here. And you open the door and there's this robot. And a lot of things were happening uh, around the world of trends at that time. And one thing that became really evident is that we're heading towards a future where 20 years from now, there's going to be this sort of bifurcation where a human touch, which is very expensive, will be mostly on the luxury end. And robotics and computers will be for everybody else because they're cheap. And, and in my trend work, I, I, I see the same sorts of things happening across the industrial spectrum. And that's how I, it, it, it's not specific to travel and tourism. If you go into schools around the United States and in some other countries, you see a lot of students now who are learning using computers. And I don't mean that they're learning how to use computers. They're learning mathematics and geography on computers. Um, but if you go into classrooms in Silicon Valley where the rich people are sending their kids, there's not a computer in sight. It's only human beings teaching other human beings. It's an example of this change in the future where computers, which are cheap, will be for the masses and, and, and high touch will be for, for luxury uh, environments. Um, and I, again, not just in, in travel and tourism or, 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 or flights, but, but, but everywhere. Um, and that high touch experience we'll be seeing even more so, uh, as I said, in, in other industries. This is an example of a, of a high-end company called uh, Net-a-Porter, um, where they're selling designer clothing. Um, and their latest offering is where they send a, um, uh, they, you, you choose on the phone or online uh, clothing that you might want to have, or you just speak to somebody who you know, asks you about yourself. And then they, they ship over to you in this car, let's say 10 different dresses. And then the person who comes with it waits and helps you try them on and helps you decide which look good on you and then take back the ones you don't want and leave you with the ones that you that you do want. It's just an example of the of the high touch that we're seeing once again on the luxury side but on the for 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 everybody else it's you know order Amazon online and if you don't like it you can return it. That's that's the the uh, the cheap way to do it. As I said, you know, since since uh you know 2019 and, and even earlier, but since 2019, we've seen economy fares up 5%, but premium cabin fares up 36%. And what I thought was really cool is this, that um, the president of Delta Airlines just recently said, the big epiphany for us is that there's a much broader demand for premium, ca for premium cabins than just business travelers. That was the epiphany post COVID. So, so COVID is changing the way that people are flying too, because they're realizing that um, there's a much bigger market for 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 leisure travelers than there was before. It's not all just about business travel. The um the next area that I'm speaking about today is about this the future of sustainability. And sustainability, it's a it's a been a huge trend for the last decade or so. And basically the main thing I want to say about it is that trends have a lot of inertia. And once they start going, they keep getting even more intense. And that's the case with sustainability, too. If you ask me where sustainability will be five years from now, it will be even more part of our DNA than it is today. And again, we're seeing across the industrial spectrum so many companies responding to that. Bumblebee Tuna is showing how sustainable they are by putting codes on each one of their cans so that you can scan the can, go onto their website and see where that fish was caught, how sustainable it is, how it got shipped to you. It's, it may be too much information for your tuna sandwich, perhaps, um, but a good idea from a marketing perspective to show consumers that you get sustainability. The, um, again, across the industrial spectrum, we're seeing all sorts of wonderful answers to this sustainable trend. This is um, the, these uh, dance floors, that use the uh, piezoelectric um, technique, 
so that when the dance floors go up and down, they create electricity, which then creates um, is basically electricity for the club. Um, this what this started actually in in Holland. This was the world's uh, first sustainable dance club. Um, but again, we're seeing the, this idea of sustainability across the industrial spectrum. Many, many more uh, planted roofs so that the things that we eat are closer to us. Uh, we're seeing crazy things, even like planted rooftops of buses, um, just to, again, to sort of show people that they get it. And then here is where I'm talking about sustainability when it comes to jets, because we're seeing all kinds of uh, innovation happening with, with jet fuel, so that 20 years from now, um, the, the, the fuels that jets will be using, uh, in, including electricity, will be much more sustainable than the fossil fuels that are being used right now. How crazy is the sustainability uh, uh, thing getting? I, I've seen th these marketed in stores around the world, organic water. Organic water, isn't all water organic? I, I, like, why do you even have to say that? It's just because it's part of what we're doing right now. So finally, I wanted to uh, just let you into my crystal ball about the future of uh, big data, AI, and machine learning, um, because it's become so much part of our lives, and it will be, if it's not already, part of almost every single business. Most people don't realize that um, we're, we all use AI and machine learning every day. If, if, if you use Gmail, then you're familiar with their autocomplete feature where you're writing your Gmail and it fills in for you what you want to say before you even know you want to say it. That's, that's artificial intelligence, which is learning from all the people that, that are using Gmail, including yourself. So you may have noticed that your Gmail autocompletes have gotten better in recent months than they were before. In, um, uh, if you look at the way food is being grown, this is uh, we're seeing more and more vertical gardens. And this is a slide. Hopefully, you can see it in the middle. There's a drone. This is a, a drone farmer that uh, goes up and down uh, with a very uh, high resolution camera where it can see each and every single plant and understand uh, if it needs more nutrients or light and take care of it that way. Um, in, uh, I wonder how many of you have used Google Duplex. Um, Google Duplex is a uh, it's a technology that that books uh, restaurant reservations and other appointments for you. Uh, it, it works seamlessly with um, with other Google technologies. Sometimes I'm I'm on, I'm on Google, like I'll look up a restaurant and it will say, "Would you like me to book?" the reservation for you. And then you put in, uh, you, you say yes, you put in your parameters. And the cool thing about it is it then telephones the restaurant on a, on a phone line and, and, and speaks in a human voice so that the restaurant wouldn't even know that it's a machine. It, it understands humans and says, hey, you know, can I get a reservation on Thursday at five o'clock? The restaurant says, well, we're booked at five, but would you do 5.30? And they say, oh, yeah, okay, 5.30 would work having no idea it's it's a it's a human being um with when it comes to uh to, to medicine we're seeing more and more um artificial intelligence genome projects uh, i was just in estonia where the country is creating a genome bank for everybody in the country if you opt in uh because of course there's uh, some privacy issues with that um but the idea is to get everybody's ge genetic information so that artificial intelligence and machine learning can then study that and see what's happening in people's genes that are leading to different diseases. So they can be uh, worked on before you catch it rather than afterwards, which is what medicine is doing right now. Um, the, sort of the, the one of the biggest things that uh, is in the trends world right now is artificial intelligence artists and um, it's th these AI uh, bots are creating art as well as creating music, creating new video. In 20 years from now, perhaps they're going to put a lot of our artists and musicians and videographers out of business because because AI is doing it right now. Um, this this actually is not AI. This uh, is, is Vermeer, uh, the girl with a golden earring. But this next slide is AI, where the AI was told to expand that painting and by 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 
analyzing all the information that it has on the web, it was able to do what's called outpainting and create the environment that the girl with the golden earring was may have been standing in uh, when when that was being being painted. Um, if uh, in, in the world of psychology, uh, I think all of you should know about Wobot. It's a uh, it's an artificial intelligence psychologist. Uh, it's free online. Um, and it apparently is pretty good at, um, at, at, at talking things out with you. And in the, when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence, I think a lot of us know about um, the, the uh, AI that um, can you know, look at a facial recognition kind of AI. But did you know that that same facial recognition is being used on fish farms to look at the faces of every single salmon in this case, so that it can tell if there's, uh, first of all, count them, how many there are, or tell if there's any problems with them. Uh, that's just gonna be normalized in the, in the next 20 years. It, it, it's amazing to me to think about how much happened in the past 20 years. Um, I mean, if you look at just, just the past 20 years, the, the Euro began, Xbox 360, Facebook, Spotify, the iPhone, 15 years old, Google Chrome, Bitcoin, FaceTime, quadru uh, uh, drones, quadrocopter drones, CRISPR technology, AirPods, and on and on and on and on. And, and to think that it was, it was just 15 years ago, in 2007, if I'm doing my math right, that the iPhone was invented. And yet, look how integral that is to all of our lives. I mean, you know, we don't, we don't go anywhere without, uh, without, without that phone. I, it, it's 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 so much it's it's changed the way that we even attend events and you know you go to an event and pretty much now you, you see everybody is holding up their phone at the event and sort of experiencing reality through a screen rather than than being there and um it's, it's what i loved about this slide is can you spot the one woman from the generation who still knows how to enjoy the moment so, you know, I guess one of my takeaways is that technology, it's an amazing, wonderful tool. Um, but of course, you know, what, what I keep, uh, what I hope humanity will do is that we will always use technology for our advantage and not be used by technology. And, um, and that's basically my presentation. I, I think this sort of look at the next 20 years is super exciting. The look at what Avenue's done in the past 20 years is amazing. But the, the bottom line is that it, it's not just about tech, but it's about the people who are creating that tech. And that means you and me and, and all of us. And, uh, and, and for that, um, I, I hope that it's going to be an amazing next 20 years. And thank you very much for having me present today. Thank you, Daniel. That was so interesting and intriguing. I, I get so fascinated when you think about what's happened in these last few years. And, and it must be amazing being in your role and just researching and, and finding this stuff out. Was there something that you felt was very specific to travel or aviation that you found in your research? Yeah, well, you know, the thing about all of this, uh, all of these trends, what's so amazing about them is that they're not siloed by industry. And a lot of what we're seeing in travel and aviation is, is related to these sort of big picture trends that we're seeing around the world. But for me, one of the most exciting things when it comes to aviation is about the fuels, because um, we, we already know how important the environment is to not just to our world, but to, to all of us, to, to most of us. And to see that th these changes happening in aviation as well uh, is is really exciting because I think it points to a, a a very positive future for the industry. Thank you again, Daniel. We appreciate you joining us, and it was intriguing. And you can, I guess, Google you if you want to know more about you or or invite you to come to your company, right? So thank you again, and um, we'll talk later. Bye. <laughs>